Hey everybody, my name is Bobby Farlis Rubio and welcome to my last episode of this outdoors series of videos. This is video number six and they have covered a 10 week period. So just think of how much has happened in the last few weeks. When I started making our videos about identifying trees, there was snow on the ground and it looked like we were in the depths of winter, even though it was the end of March. And now here we are part of the way through June it's not even summer yet, and I'm sweating in short sleeves. So Vermont is a place with incredible changes, and all of these videos have taken part just during the season spring. It's not even summer yet, but if you've watched all of the five previous outdoors videos, you will have seen 25 different flowering plants, herbs, and ferns, 14 different deciduous trees, seven evergreen tree species, seven species of insects and arachnids, five species of amphibians, at least one reptile, four mammals, two lichens, and even four birds for a total of 69 different species. And that's just scratching the surface of what can survive here in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, a place that is almost exactly halfway between the North Pole, hence our winters, and the equator, hence our tropical summers. But another thing to think about when you explore the Northeast Kingdom is that this forest was once almost completely destroyed. It's hard to imagine that Vermont was once somewhere between 80 to 90% deforested. This place where I live used to be a sheep farm before the days of the Civil War, and none of the forests that I walk through in these videos were actually forests until after the sheep farms closed. So there is some hope in the story of the Vermont forest. All of this amazing wildlife, plants and animals, fungus and insects, all of these things have survived an apocalyptic destruction of their habitat. And now we have reforestation instead of deforestation in Vermont. So it's good to think that this could happen in other parts of the world where their forests are hurting. This forest has taught us that it can recover, it can heal, and it can grow back. So come with me as we see what else is out there. And of course, even if you don't live in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, you can use the things you see in this video to help you identify species all over the eastern part of the United States and eastern Canada too. So join me as we walk in the woods one last time this year. Mm. Since my last video, the apple trees have flowered and then their petals fell off and the lilacs are almost done blooming too. I mean, sometimes two weeks is just too long to wait to observe nature, so you gotta get out there quick for some of these creatures. Lilacs are a very common sight in Vermont, but they're not native to this land. They're from the Balkan Peninsula. Humans have bred them to make thousands of varieties, but still they will not grow from seed in our land. So if you find an old lilac, there's a good chance that it was planted by a family in a household where the house no longer stands and the lilacs are the only thing that live on. Apples too might live on after a house has collapsed. These flowers have five petals and if you look at them carefully you might notice that they're arranged in the same way that the seeds will be inside of the apple that you might eat later on this summer or in the fall. And they get pollinated by all kinds of insects including this little fly but there's a bumblebee who might get his pilot's license revoked. The particular apple that you're looking at is a Macintosh. I'm not referring to the computer I used to make this video. I'm talking about Macintosh apples. This is not descended from the Macintosh tree. It is a clone of the original Macintosh tree. Most apple varieties are cloned or grafted, and that allows them to preserve the DNA that people like in the flavors and smells and colors. Apples grown from seed is like lottery. You never know what you're going to get. Well, dandelions were the yellow flower dominating the meadows last time in my video, but now it is the season of the buttercup, my little buttercup. Our horses never eat them, so they always bloom in the pasture and in the hay fields and in the other meadows. And now, just in time for this video, we have daisies blooming too. And these might be around for most of the summer, but it's hard to imagine a summer without daisies and buttercups, some of the most recognizable flowers that kids learn their names early on in life and sometimes they even use the buttercups to check if they have a preference for butter by getting that yellow color to reflect onto their chins or noses. So many hay fields right now are filled with grass that's just flowering. I would have to make a whole video to talk about identifying all the species like orchard grass and timothy and fescue but notice the look 
there's little buttercups here and there's also the big puff blow balls from those dandelions <sighs> but what you might notice is that there's a neutral field with a lot of white flowers can you think of an animal that might be using this environment as camouflage did you notice a dark shape moving in the background during this time lapse let the buck emoji point it out for you I'd be impressed if you were able to see that before. That's a doe, a mother deer, who's feeding in between nursing sessions with her little fawn, likely waiting in the woods for her. I would never try to find a fawn and disturb it, but last year my partner Dylan was walking through the woods and she almost stumbled upon this one. We left it alone, but every year many survive. But of course there are threats to fawns despite the fact that they are hard to detect. Their biggest threat is the black bear. On the day after I saw that doe, I saw this young yearling black bear heading in the same direction. I don't know what this means for the fate of the young deer, but the good news is that fawns only have to be 10 days old before they can outmaneuver the black bears. And I saw the young bear's tracks in the mud not too far away from where I saw the doe's tracks. It's crazy to think that 150 years ago, both of these animals, the bears and the deer, were missing from Vermont's forests, and now they are back. It's definitely true that black bears can be dangerous to people, but usually they are not. They like to run away from us instead. The most dangerous thing you can do is to feed a bear or get it acclimated to the human environment. That's when bears turn into trouble. This bear, we've kept it afraid of our family, but it still comes into our field to eat dandelions. See the one hanging out of his mouth? You probably don't like the idea that black bears can eat fawns, but if there were no predators for deer, the forest would be out of balance and the populations would be too high and the trees would not be able to grow back. So bears are happy to help us balance the equation. This is a beetle that barely needs an introduction. It wouldn't be June without our June bugs. And if you think they resemble the dung beetles of ancient Egypt, they do. They are scarab beetles. But you're not likely to see them during the day as much as you are likely to find them on your window screen at night. He wants your lamp. One of my favorite insects to look for at this time of year is called the spittle bug. And no, it's not because your friend hawked a loogie on the goldenrod bush next to your house. This is actually a defense mechanism. It's a little house or a home for a tiny leaf hopper. He's wrong! Which will be jumping around and flying around as an adult, but while it's a larvae. Correction! Correction! It uses this little foam that it makes to hide inside of, sort of like a, a nest or a cocoon, and that way it can suck the sap from the leaves without being bothered by predators, and then it can hide and transform into the adult that will come out later in the summer. But you might not see the adult leaf hoppers, they're very small, but you will definitely find the little wads of spittle that the spittle bugs are hiding in when they're larvae. Get it right, Bobby. Well, in the last video, I covered some of the ferns that grow here in Vermont, but one of the most common, especially in the woods, in a clearing where some logging has happened or a tree has fallen down, you'll see what's called hay-scented fern. And it grows so thick, it creates forest floors that look like an ocean or a sea of green fronds. And yes, they have that name because they do smell like a barn full of freshly mown and stacked hay. Even though we call them evergreen trees, they still need to make new leaves and branches. And this is one of the ones from the first video, the white spruce. And 
This entire segment of needles has grown in less than five weeks. This is its new growth and it will continue growing longer. If you want an estimate of how long this will get, look at what happened last year. This entire segment was just one summer. So when you look at trees like spruces, you can really see how much they grow and you can even see the mathematical pattern that seems to govern their growth. Speaking of math, balsam firs seem to love the number three. The buds that were sitting on the twigs last winter are now sprouting and for every one twig from last year, we get three new twigs this year. So three twigs turn into nine. That's multiplication, pretty good for a tree. And this central bud that you see on the top, the terminal bud, is the one that's going to make this tree taller. The red spruces will be growing in a similar fashion to their conifer cousins, but they definitely look a little further behind. See all the potential needles in this bud? If you find one, you can peel this little membrane off and see the needles exposed. You're just helping it get going. Well, like the other conifers, the white pines make it pretty easy to see the old growth from last year and the new growth. But right now, the new growth doesn't even resemble the needles that it will become. But these buds grow so explosively that a pine tree like this white pine growing in full sunshine in a field, they can get six feet taller every single year. So they grow very quickly in this fashion. Well, if you remember the saga of the willows that we started covering in our first video, I want you to notice that the female willows, the ones that make seeds, have now finished the seed making process. The males have dropped their little fuzzy flowers that make pollen, but if you go out now, you'll see seeds blowing in the wind that come from the willows and that effort to get the pollen in the right place. is a little sapling of a red oak, the first tree I talked about in the first video. Look how big the leaves are now. But red oaks have different shaped leaves when they're young compared to when they're mature trees. So when you see this leaf, you might confuse it for the other oaks like white oak. White oak does grow in southern New England, but we don't really have a lot in the woods of Vermont. However, if you want to see a white oak and compare it to a red oak, you can do so at the Fairbanks Museum because we have both of those trees growing right in front of the front door. But once they become full grown trees, the red oak's leaves are very distinctive with their sharp edged teeth, as you can see in this big oak. Well, here are the leaves of a red maple. If you remember our first video, when we talked about identifying the trees from their buds and twigs, you might see that it might have been easier before they had the leaves to identify this tree because a lot of people confuse this leaf for that of the sugar maple. Remember, the sugar maple only grows in the northeastern United States and Canada, where the red maple grows all the way down the east coast to Florida. So they have very different ranges. And if you forget how to tell their leaves apart, just compare the crowns. The sugar maple has a lot more points to it than the red maple does. If you ever get lost, just look at the flag of our neighbor to the north, Canada. That red leaf on the Canadian flag is a sugar maple leaf, not a red maple leaf. Well, it's the last hurrah for the spring ephemerals, as we're almost in summer. But here's the Canada Mayflower, a type of lily with little white flowers. And sorry, there's no pilgrims on board as far as I can tell. But you might confuse this Mayflower for another flower that blooms at the same time in the same places. The Foam Flower, the Heartleaf Foam Flower. So if you get the flowers confused, just look at the leaves. The foam flower's leaves look almost like a maple leaf or a heart, and the mayflower leaves are shaped more like a plain lily leaf. Well, one of the most lovely spring ephemerals that you'll see now in June is star flower. And yes, the flowers do look like beautiful stars, uh, and there are so many of them. Maybe I can do a planetarium show here. Do you ever get the feeling that you're being watched? 
Don't worry, they're not eyes. It's just blue-eyed grass. And it's not even a grass. It's a plant with such thin leaves that without those flowers, you probably would think it was just a lawn grass. Perhaps you recognize these flowers, not just as the flower that Horton used to hold Whoville, but this is red clover, our Vermont state flower, and something that I'm glad is blooming now just in time for this video. And this flower is filled with nectar. It's not one flower, but actually dozens of little flowers all clustered on the same head. And if you want to taste the nectar of a clover flower, this is one that makes it easy. All you've got to do is pluck one of these flowers and then put the flower on the tip of your lips like this. One or two, I got three. And hmm. Mm, no, 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 no. Mm, wouldn't be so bad to be a bee if that's what you had to taste all the time. Mm. I was so delighted to see this flower amongst the sarsaparillas and this little balsam fir here. This is an orchid. This is the pink lady slipper. And it is not that rare in Vermont, but I've never seen one here on my land. And this lady slipper belongs to a class of orchids that some of which are very endangered. The lady slipper that's pink is not so rare, but the showy lady slipper, the yellow lady slipper, and the most rare of all, the ram's head lady slipper, are plants that are close to becoming endangered or even extinct. And I'm very proud to say that my work at the Fairbanks Museum has recently allowed me to collaborate with the New Hampshire Academy of Science and we've built a STEM lab at the Fairbanks Museum. And one of the things that we do in our STEM lab is try to cultivate these rare orchids, especially the showy lady slipper and the ram's head, the ones that are closest to going extinct. We try to grow them in the lab so that we can multiply their numbers in the wild. Well, this one didn't need our help to grow in the wild, but orchids, most of them are tropical plants and most orchids grow in the air as epiphytes on the bark of a tree perhaps. So you might think this is strange to see an orchid that is adapted to growing in the soil, but that's the only way this orchid would be able to survive our cold winters by keeping its roots underground, protected from the weather, and then every spring it sends up a new sprout with a twin pair of leaves and a beautiful flower. And if you look carefully at this flower, you can see the stripes that guide the pollinators in. And there's a like a one-way turnstile. Once they go in, they can't get back out unless they go all the way through where they'll pick up pollen and deposit some on the pistils and help this flower to make some seeds. Well, I thank this Canadian tiger swallowtail butterfly for leading me to this pink lady slipper. We have both Canadian tiger swallowtails and eastern tiger swallowtails here, but the Canadian species is slightly smaller. I've had Phoebes and Robins living in my barn, but believe it or not, after living here for 20 years, this is the first summer that I have a barn swallow. A very famous and widespread bird, but new to me. Last time I looked for beavers in the Stevens River, it was sunrise. This time I went after sunset. I found a reptile. Hello, little painted turtle. Nice to see you. Unfortunately, this turtle was too swift for me to catch him with my hands. He found a good hiding place before I could grab him. I continue to hear reports from members of the West Barnet community that there might be beavers still in this channel. So I went back to see if they started repairing the dam that I checked out a couple of weeks before. I did see a lot of dogwood, red osier dogwood in flower. Maybe I should pick me up a bouquet of dogwood flowers for my baby tonight. After a bit of paddling, we arrived at the old dam, and it was just as before, in fact, probably worse. 
It had been taken apart last year, and it looks like the beavers have only made a half-hearted effort at repairing the damage. But I could hear a lot of green frogs. No, that's not Kermit tuning up his banjo. I was a little disappointed that there was no recent sign of beavers at all, but then I saw this little paddling of ducks that I could not identify. And as I watched the ducks swim, I noticed a noise rustling in the bushes. Was something following us? Let the emoji's nose guide your eyes if you haven't seen it yet. Is it one of the guardians of the galaxy? I believe that curiosity is one of the most important ingredients in an intelligent mind. And this fellow's curious. Can you see him now with the emoji? He kept coming back to check us out instead of running away. In the language of the first Vermonters, the Abenaki language, raccoons are called Aspan, and they're always the tricksters in the traditional folk tales. This one made us wait for an hour before he decided to come out and check us out up close. He got real comfortable with us after an hour or so. He even stood up on his hind legs to get a better view. I guess he didn't think we were much danger, so he relaxed and started to scratch himself just like your household dog might do. Did you know that raccoons scratch this way? I didn't. Aspan, the trickster. Off again. I've got to say that I am a little disappointed that I couldn't find the beavers, but then I remembered all the things that I did find that I wasn't planning on finding, and that is the whole point of going outside to find things that you didn't know were there. So I hope these videos have made you even more curious and maybe I'll see you out there exploring the wilds of the Northeast Kingdom.